It's a, a people, it's a community, it's a life, it's a heart, it's a spirit. That's the question. The heck would you want a picture of a tattoo of a thousand dollars on your penis for? What makes this book so relevant, even though it was written over a hundred years ago, is that it's about terrorism. The work, sex, uh, cars, bars, roads. And the children is building on what they have. They have great imagination. Dementia. It's not a diagnosis. It's a set of symptoms. And he kept explaining to me that I wasn't gay. Uh, you cannot be gay. You just so cannot. The main thing is to be open and honest and be, you know, true to yourself. Good evening and welcome to Talking About Life. Uh, tonight our topic is one that not enough people address these days, and that is colon cancer. And with me from colon, uh, from Cancer Care of Long Island, is Harriet Ornstein. And your title at Cancer Care is? I'm Director of Social Services, and I also lead the Colon Cancer Support Group. And I'm really very pleased to be here tonight, Jonathan, because I think the message we have to bring to the public is very, very important. You know, everybody talks about breast cancer, and they say that one in nine people will come down with breast cancer. Well, close to 150,000 people each year come down with colon or colorectal cancer and a huge amount of people die from it as well. But the good news is that if people go for early screening, early detection, colon cancer can be prevented. Okay. It's a preventable disease. And we're going to be exploring that on tonight's show. And we will be taking uh, viewer phone calls tonight. And our phone number is area code 718-460-9802. And if you have any questions or comments about colon cancer or anything that we say or discuss, feel free to give us a ring and we will be happy to answer you as best that we can. Um, well, why don't we just start at the beginning. What is colon cancer? Well, I think we need to take a look at what cancer is first. Okay. Cancer per se is a growth of cells that is not controlled. We all have cells in our body and they have certain functions, but sometimes it goes haywire. And when that occurs, a tumor or a growth can occur. And colon cancer is a growth or growths in the gastrointestinal tract, uh, particularly in the large intestine, the small intestine, the rectum, and the bowel. And, and um, one of the things I think that I need to say is that people don't talk about colon cancer. We call it the hush-hush cancer because people don't like to talk about that part of their body. I can, I can, I can see why it's, it's a sensitive topic, but do you find that more and more people are becoming open to it these days? I think Katie Quirk did a wonderful thing for colon cancer. It's very unfortunate that her young husband died of this disease, but when she went on to t public television and had a colonoscopy, I think she really, really opened up the topic for people to feel more comfortable in going for their screenings and for discussing it. And if you think about some of the other uh, famous people that have had colon cancer, Daryl Stra Strawberry, Ronald Reagan, I think every time these people are quoted in the paper or an article is written about them, it makes people more aware of this particular disease. Okay. Um well, what should people be on the lookout for? Are there symptoms or warning signs? Definitely, although not all the time. Okay. If you have a silent growth, which is a polyp, a small growth, you may not know about that unless you're screened for it because there's no way of knowing unless it starts to bleed whether you have a problem. But if you have unusual bleeding, if you are feeling extremely fatigued, if you are having stomach cramps of an unusual nature that last for more than a day or two, you may be having some of the symptoms that are symptoms of colon cancer. In addition, I think if you have change in your bowel habits, if you have diarrhea, if you have constipation, if you have stools that look different than they used to, these can all be warning signs that you have colon cancer, or maybe warning signs of something far less uh, significant. But worth checking out nonetheless by you know, see your physician right away? 
Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, are there risk factors associated specifically with colon cancer? There are some risk factors. They're the kinds of things that you can control. I can control. You can control. Um, all of the audience out there can control. And the number one thing that you can control is your diet. There is a feeling that a diet high in fat, both an animal fat particularly, um, a diet that does not have si significant fruits and vegetables, a diet that is low in fiber, may contribute to colon cancer. So you can control your diet. Another thing is a sedentary lifestyle. Unfortunately, we're all couch potatoes. Yes. Well, many of us are, anyhow. And if you can go and do exercise, follow many of the same guidelines that you would use to prevent heart disease, you may be preventing cancer as well. So we have diet and we have exercise. We have family history. In some families, there is a hereditary component to colon cancer. And in those families, people should be screened very, very early. Anyone that has a history of polyps. What should, polyps are? Polyps are small growths, which can be benign, meaning that they are non-cancerous. But there are some that, if they are kept in the body too long, do become cancerous or can become cancerous. So anybody who has a polyp or is bound to have a polyp when they go for some screening should be extra vigilant in terms of their screening process. Um, as far as other diseases, if you have a history of ulcerative colitis or you have a history of Crohn's disease, you may be more at risk for colon cancer and would need additional screening. So these are some of the areas I think that people need to be aware of. But the first two particularly, the diet and the exercise. Diet, exercise, it would even just uh, a short walk after dinner? Absolutely. Absolutely. You don't have to uh, go on, a, on the bars and the machines to have exercise. Usually okay. a half an hour, three days a week may do fine for you. So two or three times around the block can, can help. Absolutely. So, and uh, age is a factor as well? Yes. Cancer, uh, colon cancer is a disease of the older person. Ninety percent of the people who come down with colon cancer are usually over 50. There's a small proportion, however, that are younger. And if there is a family history, then younger people need to be tested. But this is definitely a disease of the older person. Okay, so within a family history of colon cancer or any kind of cancer, at what age is the recommended testing? Okay. There are different types of testing, but usually at the age of 50, everybody should have some baseline testing. The average person should be going to their internist or their doctor for some type of testing. And we start, would you like the sure. testing methods? We start with something called FOBT. That's the easy one. Which That's stands for? Fecal Occult Blood Test. Okay. Um, I'm sorry. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, it's a stool test. Okay. And it's very easy because all you need to do is take some stool, put it on some paper, send it to the lab, and if the blood, if there is blood found in the stool, they will send you for further testing. It is the cheapest, the least expensive of the exams. In addition, you should be going and having a DRE, which is a digital rectal exam, which the doctor can perform in the office. Unfortunately, that only goes to the lower part of your rectum and does not, is not able to see what's going on. In Fur the, further up? Yeah, in the large bowel and in the colon. So you would want to then think about a sigmoidoscopy, which is a flexible lighted tube, which goes about halfway up your colon. But it's not the gold standard. The gold standard today is the colonoscopy. 
Right. And I think people should know that Medicare is finally paying for colonoscopy. Okay. So that those who are older and in that age group, for the most part, would be eligible to get colonoscopy, and I believe it would be every two years. So that's very important to know. One of the reasons that people don't always like to go for these tests... Is it somewhat invasive? Colonoscopy is an invasive procedure. And I don't know if you've heard about virtual colonoscopy at all? No, I haven't, actually. Okay. Virtual colonoscopy is a new test which is in the process of being um, tested. The, uh, it prevents the invasion of the colonoscope. It is more of an X-ray type of procedure. And with a CAT scan, I believe a spiral CAT scan or a new type of CAT scan to the area, they are able to see growths that are within your colon area. The problem is that if a growth is found, it cannot be removed. When you have a colonoscopy, if the doctor finds a polyp or growth, he can just take his little scraper and remove that polyp and send it to the lab for a biopsy to determine whether it is malignant or whether it's benign. So if you took the virtual colonoscopy, which many people might prefer because it is non-invasive, you might have to go for a second preparation in order to then have the colonoscopy to remove whatever was found. So there are some advantages and disadvantages to each of these tests. One of the greater advantages to the colonoscopy is that if you take it and all is clear, you don't have to go again for 10 years because the feeling is that it sometimes takes 10 years for a colon cancer to develop from the time that it is a teeny polyp okay. until it becomes a full-blown cancer. So um, would that be included if you're within a high-risk group? It's still every 10 years? No. Thanks for asking that question. If you're within a high-risk group, if you have a family history, Usually the suggestion is that if your parent came down with colon cancer at age 50, you should go for your first colonoscopy at age 40, that there is a 10-year difference as to whether or not you might be susceptible as a first-degree family member. For, as far as fecal occult blood test is concerned, the feeling is people should go for that on an annual basis. So with your annual physical. Exactly because if blood is found in perhaps 30% of the cases, then it may find cancer. The sigmoidoscopy could be every five years, and the colonoscopy every 10 years. And I do believe that I left out one other test, which is the uh, barium enema test, which is again uh, where you drink a liquid and then x-rays were taken. And that test is generally every five years or so. It's a series of x-rays in the 10 or 15 minute intervals? or Correct. That's correct. And that is another way to determine what is going on. Now, none of these tests are terribly comfortable, but they're not terribly uncomfortable either. And I think that people are afraid to go for colonoscopy. Hmm. And colonoscopies are very often given under sedation. And that is the gold standard because if that polyp is found and it is removed and it is found cancerous, you are now cancer free. Right. So Which is the ultimate goal. It is definitely the ultimate goal. And there are not many cancers that are, can be said to be preventable. And colon cancer is one that is if you go ahead and if you follow the screening guidelines. Okay. And again, we are talking about colon cancer tonight, and we welcome your calls and comments and questions. Our phone number is area code 718-460-9802. Feel free to dial in and just uh, chat away. Um, what about uh, persons with compromised immune systems? Is that uh, within a high-risk group as well? Well, I've not heard that so much, but where you do run into a difficulty is part of the treatment. Um, I, we have not talked about treatments at all, but if somebody is determined to have colon cancer, there are several different types of treatment. Ideally, one would go for surgery. 
okay. and have the surgery to remove the cancer. And then, depending on the size of the cancer and the staging of the cancer, meaning how aggressive the cancer okay. is. Okay, we'll, we'll get into that in a moment. I just, um, I just want to finish up with testing right. first. Okay. Um, colonoscopy would be the most accurate test? Right. Colonoscopy is definitely the accurate test. And, and if something is found, are there further tests that are done? They might do some CAT, sta CAT scans, okay, CT so. scans, which are computerized axial tomography tests, which take pictures and x-rays and uh, read them by computer. And there's something called the MRI, the Magnetic Resonance Imaging System, which uses magnets, and something called a PET scan, which looks at the glucose in the system and can okay. determine where cancers are located. And that's probably one of the latest tests. But that's not okay. generally done so much for screening initially. For screening. But that would right. be a secondary test? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, what I wanted to say is that after a cancer is found right. and it is screened, then the determination has to be what how, stage it's in, how, do you how far it, what, advanced it is. Right. But you can't find out sometimes what stage it is until you have the surgery. Because the surgery, when a surgeon goes in and takes out what the tumor is, he is going to look at the size of that tumor, which is going to make a determination. He's going to look at the locale of the tumor. Is the tumor just in a small area? Is it stage T0? Meaning, is it just local, very local, non-invasive in the interior? Is it stage T1? where it's still localized, but it's moving more within the wall of the area. And is this tumor in the lymph nodes, stage three? Uh, if the tumors are in the lymph nodes, then you run the risk of it spreading okay. throughout other parts of the body. And colon cancer will generally metastasize to either the liver or the lungs. And when it does metastasize, that's stage four cancer, and because it's spread to another organ. So okay. And the definition of metastasize? Metastasize means spread. Okay, that's just... It's seeded cancer that spreads okay. to other parts of the body and may or may not form large tumors or small tumors. Elsewhere. Right, and it travels either through the blood or the lymphatic system. So, of course, it's I much more ideal if you can catch the cancer at an early stage and remove it surgically. And very often, if the cancer is what they call um, a T0, T1, or maybe even a T2, they may just be surgery and no further treatment. Beyond that, the treatment for colon cancer is generally chemotherapy. Okay. A tumor will be removed whether or not. Is chemotherapy always a part of? No, if the, if the tumor is very small, it's and if it can be removed, and if their lymph nodes are clear, mm -hmm. then chemotherapy may not be given. There are two types of chemotherapy. There's one that's called neoadjuvant chemotherapy, and then there's adjuvant chemotherapy. And the difference is? The difference is that the neoadjuvant is given for patients with large tumors to reduce the size of the tumor before the surgery. Okay. The adjuvant chemotherapy is given after the surgery, or for patients that are not surgical um, candidates. And that chemotherapy is then done to prevent the, the um, spread of the disease. And chemotherapy is very often one of the most difficult parts for cancer patients. It's fraught with the most side effects? Yes, um, people do complain about the side effects, and it depends on the drugs which are offered. I'll just mention the names of several of the mm -hmm. drugs which patients do take. Um, the most common chemotherapy treatment uh, are drugs called 5-FU and leucovorin, and to that they've now added a new drug which has just come on called oxaliplatin. And the clinical trials on oxaliplatin were so good that they moved that up to what we call first-line status so that 
it is now one of the major chemotherapies that are given for people with colon cancer. Um, there's also a new drug that just came on called Avastin, A-V-A-S-T-I-N, brand new, okay. which is going to um, hopefully work in a different way. Um, rather than chemotherapy, that's more than what we call a targeted therapy. Um, so there are lots of new things on the horizon for cancer patients, but you have to be able to put up with some of the side effects, and some of the side effects can be difficult. Um, the most, the side effect most talked about by patients that I see in my groups and in my private practice is fatigue. Okay. People will say, I am so tired. This is a fatigue unlike any that you or I might experience. You know, we might be tired after doing something very strenuous, but this is just a fatigue that prevents you just from tired doing all the time, don't tired. want to get out of bed, don't want to move. Correct unable to eat sometimes. Uh, as far as eating is concerned, colon cancer patients sometimes complain about difficulty in eating because of the chemotherapy. Chemo can make you nauseous. Chemo can make you have terrible diarrhea. But there are medications to control this. And over the years, and I've been doing this for many years, over the years we've seen the improvements in medication for people that are on chemotherapy. Another side effect, and you talked about before, was the immunocompromised mm -hmm. person. People that are taking chemotherapy sometimes are what we call immunocompromised because the drugs kill their white cells or they, their red cells. They kill the good cells as well as the bad. Exactly, exactly. And you sometimes need to take medication to bring your cell counts up to the proper number before you can continue that chemotherapy. So you have to be very careful when you're on chemotherapy. Sometimes people are afraid to be near kids or they don't go out, they don't want to go to the movies. Sometimes they have to stop working if they're in a profession that uh, puts them at risk to be too closely in contact with other people. So the side effects play both a physical and in some ways add to an emotional component um, for the cancer patient. And it, well, the word cancer can bring very strong feelings from anybody, whether it's just a family member or the person affected by it. Well, actually, the family member is affected, the person afflicted with it. We call the family member, usually the spouse, the hidden patient because everybody asks about the patient. But meanwhile, the spouse or the family member is the one that's taking the patient to treatment, maybe speaking with the doctors, is negotiating with the insurance company, is sometimes trying to maintain a job because uh, the cancer patient is unable to work. So it sets, the cancer itself can set up a great uh, deal of dislocation. So we say that cancer is a family disease it's not just the patient that struggles along with us with that. And that's why at, at Cancer Care, we like to hopefully provide services to patients and to family members. So you treat members. the family, not just the person afflicted. Right. In fact, um, we run support groups for patients and for family members. I have a wonderful support group for people with colon cancer, we generally get about 14 people to a meeting, sometimes husbands and wives, and they run the gamut of questions, of information sharing, of sharing of emotions, and really sometimes I have to throw them out of the building because the building is closing at 9 o'clock and they don't want to leave. They need to be able to talk with somebody else who's experiencing this cancer because their lives are so different. In fact, I had a, a patient say to me, um, I think just yesterday or the day before, he says, I hate this colon cancer. I want my life back. That's understandable. And we do have a caller. We have Brenda on the line. Brenda, whenever you're ready, feel free to say hello. Hi. Hi, um, Brenda. Hi, Brenda. Hi. 
I have um, a five-year-old child, and I would like to raise that child so that his life will be uh, cancer-free. Is there, a, is there a special diet I could, you know, I could feed this child so that it wouldn't develop problems like this? I think it's very hard to talk about a specific diet for children. I do believe that your pediatrician is probably the best one to assist you with that, but I do think that some of the um, suggestions that I made for adults with regard to diet might hold for children. I mean, certainly children need their milk, they need their calcium, they're going to need some dairy products, and they're probably going to need some meat as well. They're growing and their bones need that. But would I feed them lots of fruits and vegetables? Sure. Would I try and keep them away from junk food if I could? Sure. And I think it's really a matter of um, starting good habits, starting them out with good eating habits that they can take with them the rest of their lives. Um, but I've heard that dairy products aren't good for people, that um, they have uh, growth hormone in them and pesticides and antibiotics, and actually I've been feeding my child soy milk. Well, if your doctor feels that, feels that that's the best way to do it, then certainly soy milk is an option. But children do need to have protein, and you have to make sure that they get the proper protein as well. Um, I also have another question. May I ask another question? Sure. Sure. Uh, I, what about colonics, uh, a, a practice that's... Uh, uh, followed by a lot of uh, alternative health care people where, you know, a person goes for a cleansing of uh, the colon. Is that a good practice for... For an adult uh, or for a child? For adults. As far as I know, I have never heard of colonics being a cancer preventative. If mm -hmm. you eat properly, if you eat high fiber, if you have lots of fruits and vegetables, you're going to clean out your system in the proper manner and move your bowels correctly. So I cannot tell you that I really have the answer to that one as far as colonics are concerned. But in terms of traditional medicine, it's not been thought of as a preventative. It's not thought of as what? As a preventative, as a way to prevent okay. colon cancer. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very much. You're Thanks welcome. for calling, Brenda. And feel free to call in with your question or comment. We are live on October 2nd, 2003, and our phone number is area code 718-460-9802, and we are talking about colon cancer. Now, we were talking about side effects. Uh, we went into fatigue, and we were speaking a little bit about nausea. Right, nausea and fatigue, and one of the other side effects of some of the uh, medication is what we call hand-foot disease. I know it sounds like hoof and mouth disease, but it's not. Hand-foot disease is a neurological problem that occurs from some of the medication. And there's really not a great deal that you can do about it. You get a numbness and a tingling in your fingers. It's a neuropathy kind of situation. But the hope is that when you finish your cancer treatment, that this will disappear and this will dissipate. Sometimes it can be serious. Sometimes it's, it's minor. People do learn to adjust to it. And I think that one of the things that we talk about when you have colon cancer and dealing with side effects and dealing with treatment is that it is adjustment. How do you adjust to the changes in your lives that have occurred. Sometimes that's very difficult. And that's one of the reasons that we do exist at Cancer Care is to help people adjust to these problems, to find a way to cope, to handle things better, to look at a new normality. So I would advise you to hopefully be able to think of your life currently on hold while you're on cancer treatment. People will say to me, I need to get back to work, or I can't do what I always did, or it's so frustrating um, because I, I'm unable to do this or that. And we say to them, your job right now is to get well. Your job right now is to take your chemotherapy 
handle it to the best way that you can. And hopefully, when you're finished with your chemo, and for most people, chemo goes in, then hopefully you're going to be okay. And I should say to you, too, and I don't know if I mentioned this before or not, that 90% of people that have colon, that have a colon polyp mm -hmm. or a colon cancer that's removed early on will survive this disease. So, so I think that's hopeful. Is, yes. <laughs> that's very hopeful. And that's the reason that we stress the need for the screening. Yeah, so, yeah, screening, important. Testing, important. Um, okay, you mentioned that the, the neuropathy or pseudoneuropathy can be controlled with the help of physician. Um, are other side effects somewhat controllable as well? or? Well, I think we mentioned that the nausea can be right. controlled by some new medications. Vomiting can be right. controlled. People who get diarrhea can take Lamotil or other anti-diarrhea anti preparations. So there are some things that you can do to control it. Obviously, if you're very fatigued, you're going to take a nap. Right. Or you should take a nap or stop fighting it. On the other hand, there are some people that need to fight it. You know, they, they're not going to give in to their symptoms. So sometimes they push very hard. That may work for them. Well, how important is the mental aspect of the battle? The mental aspect is very important. You know, people talk about um, your state of mind and if, you're at, if your attitude is good, that you're going to cure your cancer and everybody has to be optimistic and so on. Some, those of us who are in the social work field sometimes have a bit of a problem like that because we sometimes find people who have wonderful attitudes and are very optimistic and don't do well anyhow. So it's not only the optimism that's going to help you. Sometimes it's a bit of the luck of the draw. What you do get if you're optimistic is a good quality of life, a okay. better quality of life. And that is the aim. The aim is to make the quality of life the best you can, despite the fact that you have cancer. Okay. And we have Frank on the line. Frank, uh, do you have a question or comment? Yes. Uh, I want to congratulate uh, you for a terrific program. Um, Thank you. But I'm wondering, uh, what if you have a member of your family who's previously had a history of polyps and um, has let too much time go by from the recommended time that the doctor wanted to retest, and, uh, you know, she won't go back? How do you convince her to go back? Is she watching the program? Hello? Is she watching the show, Frank? Yes. Yeah. Okay. If, if she is watching the show, I hope that she realizes that it's very important for her to be re-screened. Screening is a necessity if you've had a polyp already removed, then you may have other polyps. What did the doctor say about when she needed to come back? Uh, two years. And how many years is it? It's been about four, maybe. Well, it's never too late. Is, can she tell you why she doesn't want to be rescreened? Uh, yeah, I, uh, when we talk about it, it's, uh, I guess, the fear, she says. Uh, she likes no news is good news. But that's putting your head in the sand, because no news could sometimes be very bad news. No news can be good news. Just imagine what it's like to go for that colonoscopy and to wake up, and the doctor says either there were no polyps or I removed the polyps, and it looks fine to me. And the longer you wait, if you have a polyp that turns cancerous, the more likely it is that it may spread and spread to other parts of the body. And then it can become a terminal disease. And there's no need for that. The point that I'm trying to make today is that colon cancer is curable and can be prevented when it's discovered early. So please, I hope your wife takes this message to heart. Are there any uh, therapy or support programs that are run, perhaps, that I could uh, take her to? Well, Cancer Care runs a program usually for cancer patients. We don't generally speak, see people in the pre-screening process, but in, in this kind of a situation where somebody is having such a difficult time, 
I am sure that one of our social workers would be more than glad to speak with her over the phone and discuss her fears and concerns with her because sometimes when you get your fears and concerns out on the table, it, ma it makes it easier. It goes away. You know, when you hold these things in, it becomes more difficult. And you build it up, and it becomes a phobia, and you say that you can't do it. And sometimes if you talk about it, it doesn't seem as bad as it really is. So let's talk about it. Let's make that um, one of our goals. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. Thank you, Frank. Okay, um, you had mentioned advanced stages of cancer, um, and we touched on clinical trials as far as uh, you had mentioned the medication that just came out of clinical trials. Mm -hmm. um, what is a clinical trial? A clinical trial is the putting together of a new drug by a drug company to see whether or not it's going to offer something to patients with a particular disease. You have clinical trials for every illness. And there are several stages in a clinical trial. There's stage one where you check the safety of a drug. That can be a most dangerous time, and very often that stage one drug is given to people for whom there is no other hope or no other drug that will work. There are stage two trials where small amounts of people are given a drug, and they may be what we call uh, randomized. One group of people may get a known drug and the other group of people may get the newer drug and then they'll compare the results. Okay. And in stage three trial, large amounts of people, maybe you may have a thousand or two thousand people trying the drug and they may be in a randomized trial as well. But somebody always gets a drug. If you okay. go into a trial... You're not getting a sugar pill. You're not getting a sugar pill. You're not getting a placebo. You will get something that works. And very often what comes out of a trial is what makes cancer treatments work, the new things that are on the horizon. And I often say to my patients, particularly patients who are not doing well and maybe have exhausted some of the treatments, as long as you stay alive and as long as they are doing clinical trials, there may be something out there for you. You can go to cancer.gov on the website or the National Cancer Institute uh, numbers and find out every single clinical trial that what's is available on? and okay. what's going on. Mm -hmm. Okay, and we have Harry on the line with us. Harry, do you have a question or comment? Yes, I do. I, uh, I've had a few cancer uh, problems in the last uh, couple of years. And I've uh, lung cancer, colon cancer, and finally liver cancer. Now the problem is before I had the liver cancer, uh, I w had terrible diarrhea from the uh, chemo. <clears throat> the thing is, uh, with this liver cancer, an oncologist surgeon uh, spoke to me about having an infusion pump mm -hmm. that will deliver can chemo directly to the liver. Right. Now, the thing is, how good is this pump? I've been having a little trouble with it. Oh, you have it already? Yes, I have it already. Mm -hmm. And uh, I had maybe two or three injections of the chemo, which lasts me two weeks. Mm -hmm. And I go for another refill, so to speak. Now, the thing is, it conked out on me. The pump mm -hmm. went bad. They didn't give me the right amount of cc's for the two weeks. They took out the pump. Now they put in another new one. Mm -hmm. I didn't receive the chemo yet. Uh, they just put in a new pump. Now, just how good is this pump? Will it last any time, or is it just uh, a fly-by-night thing? As far as I know, this is not a fly-by-night treatment. There is a reason for giving the chemo directly into the liver because it's going to that site directly and it's not going to harm other cells throughout your body and you're probably going to have less side effects when it goes directly to the liver. Is that is that happening for you? Uh, 
So far, yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you're not getting nausea and vomiting and all no, the things that we talked about. No, I don't get that symptom. The only thing I get is the diarrhea, the diarrhea. severe diarrhea. Mm -hmm. Well, that, of course, you have to be careful about because you have to be careful that you don't become dehydrated. And uh. that your doctors will be able to tell um, when you go for follow-up. I mean, if you really don't feel well, your skin feels a certain way when you're dehydrated, you need to make sure that you're taking lots of fluids is the bottom line. Uh, to avoid dehydration if you're getting a lot of diarrhea. But the pump is a good method of treatment. So I hope that it's going to work for you. I hope so, too. Good Thank luck. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thanks for calling. And right. you can call us, too, at 718-460-9802. We are taking your calls and comments about colon cancer, screening, prevention, living with, overcoming, anything you want to throw at us, we will do our best to answer. That's right. <laughs> okay. Um, summing up uh, clinical trials. You three. Right. And stage three clinical trial, I think we said, is the stage where you can have several thousand people on a drug. And with the hope that the drug is going to be something that's going to be state of the art and will really work for you and um, maybe something that's going to be better than anything else that's out there. Again, clinical, and the people sometimes don't want to go on to clinical trials because they say, I don't want to be a guinea pig. But actually, you're not a guinea pig because people who are in clinical trials are usually managed and monitored very closely, possibly more closely than when they just go to visit their own oncologist. Um, there's a lot of, a lot riding right. in, on a clinical trial. I mean, would they, they wouldn't put somebody at further risk with a clinical trial? Only if they were in stage one, stage one where you're testing for safety. But the idea is not to put people at risk. And obviously right. what has happened is, and particularly with one of the colon cancer protocols, was that they were finding that some people were at risk, that there were people that had appeared to be dying or getting sicker from the treatment, and they stopped the treatment, and they cut back on the amount of medication that was being given. So I think that you can feel that you are being well taken care of if you are in a clinical trial. Okay. And we urge people to, to check it out. To look it up, and you said cancer.gov? Cancer.gov. That's National Cancer Institute. Okay. Um, but we, we were talking a little bit about support as well. Mm -hmm. And some of the programs that Cancer Care offers. I'd love to tell you about what I would love did. to hear about them. <laughs> Cancer Care was established in 1944. Um, we've been around a long time. We are now a national agency, and we have a constellation of services which we offer to people throughout the country, but primarily in the tri-state area where we have our local offices. And I'd like to show you our Cancer Care okay. brochure. Actually, I'll hold that up okay. for you. Right here. And Very good. And we know that a cancer diagnosis changes everything. And what we can do is we can have you talk with a trained social worker. We can have you attend a support group. We can have you become part of our financial assistance program. Now, we do provide oh. limited financial assistance. We cannot pay your rent. We cannot pay your car payments. But what we do do for cancer patients is provide some financial assistance for the cost of transportation to treatment, home care, child care if a mother has cancer and uh, you need somebody to babysit for you. We have some funding available for that. We also can provide some funding for pain medication. And you might ask, where do we get our funding? Cancer Care does not get any government funding. We're, private donations. We are primarily funded by private donation, by corporate funding by bequest, which are left to us by, I guess what you call people who are satisfied with our services. Okay. So we feel that the financial assistance that we offer is very, very important. In addition to the financial assistance, we've got a wonderful web page. Um, which is? Uh, www.cancercare.org. O-R-G. O-R-G. And you can go onto that web page and find information about many types of cancer, 
You can find information about treatments. You can have links to other organizations. You can find out about funding, about advocacy. Um, it's really, actually, it's an award-winning web page. So we're very, very pleased um, that we have that to offer you. We also have our educational programs. Cancer Care is becoming widely known for our telephone education programs. We can have two or 3,000 people across the country on the telephone with a main man professor or main right. woman professor or a doctor of oncology or surgery uh, or sometimes even a cancer care staff member talking about various types of cancer, bringing the latest information to people um, about treatment, about side effects. And you will get an opportunity within that hour, a few people will at any rate, to speak with the doctor okay. and ask your questions. So we certainly suggest that you try through our web page to link up with our teleconference. If not, and you don't have a computer, and not everybody is on the computer yet, you can call 1-800, the number 4, I'm sorry, 1-800-813-HOPE, H-O-P-E, which is 4673. Okay. So please feel free to call us to find out about our educational programs, our counseling programs, our financial programs, and I think that I have not talked about <laughs> our um, informational programs, okay. which are our educational programs, which we offer in-house, which is in the cancer care offices, which are either in New York, New Jersey, Connecticut, or Long Island, or the um, programs that we mainly offer to professionals. We okay, also well, offer a number of programs for professionals in terms of working with cancer patients, learning how to run a support group, um, things of that kind. Okay, well, can you break down into some of the programs that you're talking about? Well, I'd like to talk primarily about our individual counseling and group counseling program. Okay. Because I think that having someone to talk to when you're having a pro life threatening problem such as this is relieving. I think that people call us and they say, I'm scared, I'm anxious, I'm frightened, I'm angry. There are so many emotions that are generated when you get a diagnosis of cancer, and you don't always want to burden your family member. You don't want your wife or your husband or your children to really know perhaps the extent of what you're feeling. And women tend to be more verbal and more vocal, although I have to tell you that in our Long Island office, we have about 20 men who come to a biweekly um, prostate cancer group. So we can't say that men don't come for counseling, because they do. Okay. And they find it very helpful in terms of sharing information and bringing information to each other. And I did mention the colon cancer support group that I lead in Long Island, which is certainly open to people who live in Queens. Our office in, is in Woodbury. It's not very far from most areas in Queens. And we do not have a colon cancer support group in our Manhattan office. So if you do have colon cancer and you're interested, please call us at 516-364-8130 and say you're interested in joining the colon cancer support group. And I will be more than happy to call you back. Okay, and uh, while we are live in Queens, this program does air in taped form in Manhattan and on Long Island. So, you know, Long Island viewers call, Queens viewers call, Manhattan viewers call, but the support groups are primarily on Long Island. Correct. In addition, March is Colorectal Awareness Month, and every March or early April, we run a large seminar on Long Island. We've done it at Hofstra, we've done it at Adelphi, we've done it at uh, Tillis, last year we did it at, not at Tillis, at uh, DiMatteo Center, we've done it at Fleet Bank, and we bring about 70 or 80 people in and several doctors in various spectrums and a nutritionist to discuss, discuss the nutritional aspects. And it's always very well attended, it's always free, and lest I forget, 
all cancer care services are free. And I want everybody to be aware of that because we feel that people who do have cancer have enough problems paying their medical bills that right. they don't need to pay for their counseling and educational and informational services. And if you need information about any type of cancer, please feel free to call us. Feel free to call, check out the website. I mean, there is so much information on that website. It's, yeah, I don't want to use the word overwhelming, but it's just vast. I mean, you just keyword in what you're looking for and you can find it. So, you know, any type of cancer that you might want to learn a little bit something about, you don't even necessarily have to be dealing with it personally, if you're just curious and want to learn a little bit more, the website is a valuable resource. Absolutely. I mean, I think cancer is something that everybody needs to be aware of. Even if you're a young person, you know, you don't think very much about it, but there is screening that people should go through, young women should be going for, for pap tests. Uh, people who, who smoke should be well, actually, mm. today they're saying that maybe chest x-rays don't even pick up that many cancers. But people who smoke maybe should reconsider and read materials about smoking. Uh, there's even a feeling that smoking and alcohol may pit play some role in colon cancer. It may be another one of the risk factors that we didn't discuss earlier. And certainly, um, moderate alcohol for some cancers as preventative may work well, may work well for heart disease, but I don't think anybody has ever said that smoking is healthy. So... Yeah, well, not for about 20 or 30 years, anyway. Right. <laughs> but um, you mentioned young people. I, how does... A, should a parent... Actually, let's hold that thought for a moment. And we have uh, Muli. Muli. Yeah, hi. Hi, good evening. How are you? Hi. Okay. Uh, thank you for the wonderful show. Uh, I wanted to ask you about uh, colon cancer. Uh, is it true that a lot of people who eat uh, red meat get this kind of cancer, or do vegetarian people also get this kind of cancer? Could you uh, well, explain to us, please? Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, I think that we had mentioned earlier that red meat is a risk factor. Now, obviously, not everybody that eats red meat is going to get colon cancer, just as everybody who is a vegetarian is going to stay healthy and not develop cancer. If you have genes, if you have a family history, if you have a propensity, right. maybe that red meat is going to be the thing that pushes it over the line. Yeah. But I can't say to you that just because you eat red meat, or you're going to get colon cancer, or just because you're a vegetarian, that you'll be safe. Right, right. But it, the, the recommended vegetable serving is about five servings of vegetables a day yeah. and I think a serving is gen generally considered about a half a cup so okay. a nice big salad and some cooked vegetables with some of your meals would probably do it okay another question if you don't mind can I sure yeah uh, basically uh, I've been reading uh, in a lot of vegetarian sites about uh, milk you know even milk they say is not good for the human uh, body itself uh, have you come across something like this, or is soy milk the best thing, or uh, what's yeah. your take on that, please? Okay, I, I think a lady asked that question before. Again, I think it has to do with the fats. Uh -huh. The feeling is that if you drink skim milk, yeah. that it should not be problematical. Okay. Now, of course, nobody's really ever done a study on the antibiotics right. that might be in milk, mm -hmm. uh, whether that is indeed a carcinogenic factor, a cancer-causing factor, I don't think that's ever been fully proven, just as the fact that they've studied waters, water in some communities and uh, overhead lines. There are a number of things that are just not in yet, but yeah. certainly to lower your fat okay. is probably a very good thing to do. Yeah, thank you so much for answering the question, and uh, it's a wonderful show. Please continue to do the good work, and uh, let somebody else call you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you very much. Okay. Um well, we have about two minutes left. Oh, my goodness. Yes, yes time does fly. Mm -hmm. Let's uh, reiterate some of the key points that we went over. Um, okay, screening, detection. Screening and detection are very important. You should definitely start at the age of 50 if you have no known risk factors. At the age of 40, perhaps, if there are family members that have had it. And if you have a history of some of the um, genetic diseases, you may even need to start in your teens and 20s, a so. lot younger. 
Right. Okay. So screening is very important, and the major types of sque screening, as we discussed before, were the fecal occult blood test, stool the test, stool test, the sigmoidoscopy, the barium enema test, and the colonoscopy. Those are the primary uh, screening methods that we've okay. discussed. And um, upon discovery, um, treatment. Discovery, probably surgery. If you can't be operated on surgically, chemotherapy. Um, radiation, on occasion, we never discussed radiation, which is radioactive energy. Radiation is given very often for cancer in the rectum, the last eight inches of the intestine. Sometimes um, that will definitely reduce the size of the tumor. We have not also talked about a colostomy, okay. which is... Which is a, a topic too big to get into okay. in one minute. Okay. <laughs> but the Cancer Care website and phone number have a wealth of information and call... Call 1-800-813-4673. That's the Cancer Care Hope number, 1-800-813-HOPE. And we hope that you will certainly call us if you have any questions or any concerns with regard to cancer. Cancer Care has been here since 1944 to serve you. Go to our website, www.cancercare.com. Dot org. Okay, and with that, I want to thank you, Harriet, for joining us for this hour. Um, I hope we helped. If we helped at least one person, we've done our job. Well, thank today. you so much, Jonathan, for having me. Uh, again, I'm glad that you could be with us, and I hope that you will join us next time. You can check out our website, which will have a link to the Cancer Care website. It's www.talkingabout.info, or you can write to us at box 20713. Laurel Park, New York, 11002. Thank you again, and have a good night.